Guardian State to you. 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 Now, we're making legal history today, Saul. Legal history, I tell you. I love it. This is the first time in the recorded history of mankind when there has ever been a CLE being recorded and a simulcast of a podcast, all right? I am deeply honored. All right, well, I'm going to, uh, first of all, I'm going to turn this over to you, Saul. Tell everybody all about you. I have a, a broadcast background. Mm -hmm. It was my first love. But my parents had other ideas, so since I couldn't stand the sight of blood, I became a lawyer. Right. Had to be one or the other. Sure. But anyway, um, I had begun a, a talk, blog talk radio program about a month or two ago. It's on Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. And uh, people could just tune in blogtalkradio.com. It's called It's Your Law. Right. And it kind of takes off where my former cable show of today's law on Greater Media Cable and Comcast left it uh, when there was change in ownership and what have you. But it's my hope to help people not be afraid of the legal system, even though it is scary and has a very ominous mystique, right. but to know how to utilize it for their benefit. Mm -hmm. And whatever I can do to inform so they're better prepared when they go, they'll be less afraid. I'm I, afraid I, of lawyers. You know, I have a different take on this. Many times my clients will come to me and they'll say, you know, they've done X, Y, Z, and they'll say, oh, I'm nervous about this. And I say, you want to be nervous about this. You know, you've got big problems. But um, you think you're developing much of a following on your, on your podcast? It's getting there. It's still a baby. Right. And uh, most certainly it's up to daddy to promote it right. more. And uh, with a busy law practice, that's not always easy to do. No. I've been blessed to be an attorney for... Uh, it's hard to believe, but for 43 years. For, I was even born 43 years ago. That's I amazing. know, I know. But in uh, in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, right? Uh, one year less in New Jersey. Right. I went to Rutgers, Camden. Grew up in Camden, which used to be a wonderful city, and I have hopes that right. maybe someday it will rejuvenate. And I I like to uh, write blogs for Huffington Post and other legal articles. User friendly, usually. Well, you're going to have plenty of things to write about after today, and I know that you enjoy kind of a widespread practice, especially um, in Pennsylvania. But I know when you're over in New Jersey, you like to do uh, people type things. Yes. Uh, municipal court and uh, traffic, traffic offenses. DUI. Right. And I wanted to kind of talk about the DWI with you today because yes. um, there's uh, some controversy going on right now um, dealing with a particular aspect of uh, drunk driving, and um, it's something that may result in some significant legislation um, coming down the pike and being enacted into law. We'll just have to see. Um, it deals with this uh, device that um, is now mandatory in New Jersey called the Ignition Interlock Device. And uh, could you just kind of tell people what you know about it? Yes, well, basically it's, it's almost frightening because it's confiscatory. Mm -hmm. A person who has had a DUI conviction even an early one, early in their life, not necessarily uh, two or three, if they want a driver's license, they have to have an ignition interlock placed on their car. Right. Go into this? Oh, okay. <laughs> what is this? Um, the judge recommended I get one. Stop. And this penalizes the family members, the people that don't drink. But what is so frustrating, and I do not understand the logic, but we often don't when it comes to legislation. Right. Even while they are suspended and can't drive, they have to have that ignition interlock on there. Let's, uh, let's take everybody through, through this step by step. And I'm just going to cite the statute, which is... 
Well, the legislative findings are at 39 colon 4 dash 50.16, but the actual guts of the statute, which uh, imposes these penalties you just mentioned, are at 39 colon 4 dash 50.17. Let's just kind of walk everybody through it. Good. I want to break it into three different sections. Um, let us assume for the sake of argument that you are a first offender and your offense did not happen in a school zone, it's just a routine garden variety drunk driving case. And you have a blood alcohol level which is less than point, um, point 0.15, okay? Correct. Now that can mean one of two things. Either it means that you're literally less than point 0.15, you could be point 0.08, 0.09, point 0.13, it doesn't matter. Or alternatively, that there is no breath test reading because your breath test results have been excluded either because of a Fourth Amendment issue, in other words, you're able to suppress those uh, suppress results, or because of a technical or scientific challenge you were able to successfully raise in terms of the way the alcohol test was operated. But under those limited circumstances, first offender, non-school zone, BAC 0.15, less than 0.15, the judge has the option as to whether or not to uh, impose the ignition interlock device, okay? And under New Jersey, current New Jersey law, that's the only time the judge has any discretion at all. So if the BAC for first offender is 0.15 or greater, um, the judge must uh, have the interlock installed. If the defendant is a second or a third or subsequent offender, it is also mandatory under those circumstances. It is mandatory in every circumstance where there is a refusal to submit to a breath test. In other words, where the individual has been convicted of refusal to submit to a breath test the um, ignition interlock device is mandatory. Um, and of course it would be mandatory in every instance where there's a school zone uh, yes. in, involved in the charge. So you often you'll have attorneys uh, for first offenses that their main thrust of the defense will be to try to uh, prevent the ignition interlock device from being installed. And sometimes that's a, you know, that's a, kind of a major battle. It but, is maddening. But it can, it can really meet the needs of the client. Now, what happens is and this is really because there's an ethical issue here, which I wanted to talk to you about a little bit. Um, the way the statute works, assuming that the judge, um, let's say that the defendant is first offense, the defendant's BAC is 0.15, all right? For a first offender, the range of the interlock device is between six months and one year, okay? Now, th technically, the way the statute reads is the judge is required to have you install the ignition interlock device on any vehicle that you own or principally operate immediately, okay? I guess leave court and go get it installed. Then it, the idea is it would stay on your vehicle the entire time that you're under suspension. And then, after you've gotten your license back, it would remain on your vehicle for a determinate term that the judge has given you that would be between six months and a year. Um, if you were a second offender, you would have to, of course, get the ignition interlock device installed immediately as per the judge's order. It would have to remain on your vehicle for the two years of mandatory suspension that you get for second yes. offense. And then for determinate term, following your, the end of your suspension period of between one and three years, okay? And it's the same for third offenses of one to three years. Now here's the ethical issue. And you just touched on it a moment ago, when the defendant has installed an ignition interlock device on his car while he's, in, while he's serving a license suspension, who's the one that winds up getting punished? Yes, the family members or other legitimate drivers who are not drinking right. or who need the vehicle, maybe for medical appointments or for, for some other legitimate purpose. So let's say, for example, the person is married, it's a family that has one car. The wife is the one who's going to be the primary driver now since the husband can't drive anymore. So over and above the monthly expense, which is not inconsiderable, I mean, we're talking about something that could range anywhere from $75 to $125 a month, depending upon the options that you, you select. It isn't the defendant that has to blow into this instrument. In order to start the vehicle initially, the innocent spouse or child or whoever else it is that was not, had nothing to do with drunk driving has to blow into the instrument to get the, the car to start and then periodically blow into it while the car is in operation, okay? Yes. Um, what possible good does this serve? Do you have an answer for that? None, in my personal <laughs> opinion. That was the easiest question I've been asked in a long time. Well, I, I think I know the reason why, and I suspect it's because the primary movers behind this bill is mothers against drunk drivers. Um, they are, um, 
lobbyists, very powerful. They are big supporters of ignition interlock devices, and they were able to persuade the legislature that there are an enormous number of um, intoxicated well, people can be, who've been convicted of drunk driving that are driving during their periods of suspension. Okay. Yes. Now, to the extent that that's true, the legislature has already addressed that with a criminal statute, 2C 40-26, um, which requires that they go to jail for you know for between six months and uh, 18 months. Um, but I mean, have your own experience? Have you seen all that many people out there driving on the revoke list after they've been convicted of drunk driving? Not too many, thank goodness for them. Right. But there are. I mean, anyone who alcoholism is an addiction right. or, or drugs and anyone who is one of those will just take any opportunity when the heat seems to be off to go back to doing what they shouldn't be doing it, it I can see the logic but and I, I certainly I don't think any of us uh, don't appreciate the work the good work that mothers against drunk driving are doing and the pain that each of them has has suffered right. and the loss they've suffered, but I really do believe this is an overreach legislatively. Suppose the person wants to doesn't own the car anymore. Well, what is to keep them from selling the car? It is so ridiculous the way it's framed. So let's just take a look at it as an extreme. If you're dealing with a first offender with a BAC of 0.15 or greater. Um, this is an individual who is going to have to have the ignition interlock device installed on his vehicle and serve out a suspension of between seven months and a year, which would be your non-school zone first offense range of punishment for suspension. The family is going to, who uses the car, if they do it right, will have to blow into the instrument to start it, run it, you know, and that could be a pain in the neck. And they didn't do anything wrong. And it could be an emergency or they could have asthma. Oh, sure. I mean, it could be a million things. But the bottom line is that these are people who are being, I don't want to use the word punished, but uh, certainly inconvenienced through no fault of their own, plus the additional expense of, of, of doing it. Now, if you talk about a second offender, as we said a moment ago, that's a two-year obligation the family would undertake. And then if you're dealing with third offenders, a 10-year obligation that the yes. individuals would take. And by the way, you know, the fact that you serve out a seven-month or two-year or ten-year suspension doesn't mean you start driving again. No. You have to administratively go through all the requirements of the Motor Vehicle Commission. And yes. it's only then, after they've physically handed you a license, that the um, requirement of the ignition interlock device, in other words, that you can you can drive but only with a car that has an ignition interlock device, really kind of goes into effect. But in the meantime, you may have paid for years for this device and had it installed on your vehicles, right? Yes, and it, it, it seems so wrong. It definitely seems punitive and it seems confiscatory. Well, let me ask you a, a question about uh, an ethical question. Yes, All certainly. Right? And um, here's the situation. The judge is required in sentencing to order you to install the ignition interlock device. However, there is no follow-up on this either in the courts or at the Motor Vehicle Commission. Yes. The judge does not call you back into court a week later and say, okay, let's go out to the parking lot. Did you do it? That doesn't happen. No. Um, the courts have better things to do than that. The Motor Vehicle Commission doesn't have the resources to, to do this either. All they're looking for is this, that if you've served out the determinate term of your drunk driving suspension and you want to get your license back, you've got to show them proof that you've installed the ignition interlock device on, and I'm going to keep things simple for now, the vehicle or vehicles that you principally operate, okay? Yes. So, here's the ethics question. Since there is no checking, and there's no point to installing the ignition interlock device during the suspension term, it doesn't bring anything to the table, all it does is punish innocent so people and waste money, do you think you could ethically tell a client to ignore the court's sentence? Never. Well, let me finish and say, <laughs> you can ignore the court's sentence, at Nobody's your own gonna, risk. At, at, well, at your own risk, but I mean, you can ignore the court sentence, and then at the end of the suspension term, you want to get your license back, the day before, go down and see one of the providers, get an ignition interlock device installed, show proof to the Motor Vehicle Commission, and they will give you your driver's license. Is there an ethical prohibition, or you know, you see a problem with doing that? I feel uncomfortable doing that because they can change the regulations at any time. Right. It's not going to be considered as an ex post facto law. 
<clears throat> they're, they're sort of stuck. The, uh, the other thing that bothers me, the .15 measuring stick, that person might have had that one aberration of conduct and they went out and had too much to drink that one night in their lives. They may not be an alcoholic or they may not be a habitual drinker. Correct. So I don't know that that should really be a, a milestone or a delineating mark. Well, let me ask you this then. Can we go back to the ethical issue here yes. for a second? Um, let's say you're dealing with a second offender. So yes. this, we're going to be talking about somebody who has a, a long period of time. He'd have to have the ignition interlock device installed on his vehicle. What would you advise somebody about this? What would you say? I would say you are taking a chance, a very severe chance. And what chance are they taking, though? Well, the fact that if they are caught without it. But they're not going to be driving. They're on the revoke list. Right. Okay. Well, we hope not. We hope not. Mm -hmm. um, but that can happen. And uh, unfortunately, again, the habitual offender or the habitual drinker or addict is going to ignore the safeguards. It, it's, it's very sad. Mm -hmm but it is a reality in life. So I, I still, my own personal feeling is are on the side of caution. You can explain this to your client. I right. think you have a duty to do that. Right. But at the same time, I think you have to, I think you have to worry them a little bit because the consequences are so severe. You know what I'd like to do with clients? Uh, I mean, the one yes. piece of advice that I give them always, and I know that you do the same thing, is I'll say to them, look, you may not drive any vehicle in New Jersey, whether you have a valid license, you're on a revoke list, it doesn't matter. You may not drive any vehicle at all unless it's equipped with an ignition interlock device. I don't care if it's a police vehicle, or a delivery yeah. truck, a FedEx van, anything. You can, a rental car, it doesn't make it, even a, even a lawnmower, you can't drive any type of motor vehicle that's not equipped with an ignition interlock device, okay? I think that's very important for them yes. to know initially. What I may say to them is the judge has ordered you to install the ignition interlock device. Um, the likelihood of the judge checking on you is extremely uh, remote. remote, okay? Um, the one thing you've got to be careful, though, is you, have, you should understand that motor vehicles will not restore your driving privileges until you demonstrate proof that you have an ignition interlock device on any vehicle that you principally operate. So although the judge has told you to do it right away, Make sure you've done it at least by the date that you're supposed to get your driving privileges restored. What happens if motor vehicle enacts a regulation that requires a certification by the driver that they had it on all, at all times during the suspension? Well, then it's going to be, uh, be, be giving very bad legal advice. But as yeah. far as I know right now, that's not the state of the law. No. But I agree with you. They could change the regulations well, anytime We know they want. the tentacles reach out and they seem to expand. <laughs> and I'm not advocating this necessarily. I know. Um, but by the same token, you know, you you really want to tell your client to punish innocent people and squander money that's completely unnecessary. I mean, money that can be going for more legal fees. Yes. I just try to be practical about these things. Yeah. So, uh, your your position then is you would just kind of like just what would you say? Go ahead and install it tomorrow. I would say do what the judge has told you to do. Mm -hmm. There, there is a chance that uh, it may not be followed up, but I don't recommend that you take that chance. The other thing, I don't know how you feel about this. I talk to my clients about the possibility that they may have a drinking problem. Right. And I think we have that duty too, and to try to steer them to AA or some other self-help program. And if they have that hanging over their head, they are going to be more inclined, I think, to abide by the teachings of that organization that they happen to visit or the counseling service, and maybe be more reluctant to drink. Mm -hmm. I, I think that we do have a moral responsibility, if not ethical and professional, to try to dissuade any of our clients from persisting in conduct that has gotten them in trouble in the first place. And I'm not being self-righteous. Oh, I know you're not. And it's what you're bringing up, though, is an extremely difficult issue because it, it, you know, I'm not a doctor. I'm barely a lawyer. And I'm not in a position to make a diagnosis of whether somebody has an alcohol problem. Of course, you have somebody who's a third offender or, you know, just is showing a degree of, of alcohol consumption that could not possibly be done by somebody who is other than an inveterate drinker. Uh, I agree with you, especially, but not 
for any saving the guy's life. My perspective is, you know, I, it'll be helpful at sentencing. It'll help you in your life, but it'll also Absolutely. help you with the judge. So Absolutely. You, know, you have nothing to lose by getting yourself with the program. Right. Um, and it's just such an, an, an intractable problem. Uh, so difficult for people who are in the throes of this to combat, not only from a psychological standpoint, but many of them are so physically addicted to alcohol, uh, their body's so used to drinking every day by starting at 4 o'clock, I mean, it's like an alarm clock inside of But they can get over that. I, mean, I, I know they can. It's just, they just have time to Time is a healer. They just have to be willing to go through the process of detoxifying themselves and, uh, um, and being motivated to do it. And Unless people that have, have gotten involved with either Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, any of those organizations. Right. Well, it's, it's a way of life. It isn't just a remedial issue. And when they have gotten into it, they're very grateful that they found it. Right. And uh, are almost happy they had the experience that they did. Hopefully, they didn't kill somebody in the meantime and end up in state prison. Well, they'll be uh, they'll be drinking yeah. jailhouse hooch if they do that. Yeah, I try to uh, scare my clients a little bit about the consequences. They could be driving; they may not have had much to drink. But if someone runs in front of their car, if the if the alcohol had any part in it, yeah, I, frequently I'll say the same thing. I say the cops did you a favor. You could have killed yourself. God forbid you could have killed yes. somebody else, and then you'd be going to look, you'd go to state prison. And people will listen to lawyers. That's mm -hmm. the funny part. We are in a unique position. Uh, they won't listen to their spouses or family members. They'll they'll just blow them off, right. or even their doctors. Right. Somehow, sometimes we uh, lawyers seem to be able to convince. Uh, so there's a there's a problem with the statute that I wanted to talk to you about. Surely. That uh, is it's really unclear, and I think it's a result of a mistake by the legislature. So I wanted to kind of get and into they that. They make mistakes. Yeah, I didn't they know that. Yeah, they make mistakes all the time. There are two iterations of the uh, of the statute, uh, and again, these iterations come about as a result of lobbying of uh, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, primarily before Congress. Congress takes action and the states have to kind of follow through in order to qualify for fe federal highway safety dollars. It's the use of the taxing and spending powers. Yes. So the first iteration of the law, which occurred in 2000, is when it went into effect. Let me just read you what they said. This, this statute I cited before, 39.4-50.18, okay, and here's what it says. The court shall notify the director of the Division of Motor Vehicles. It shows you the legislature hasn't even changed their own right. statute to make it the Motor Vehicle Commission. The, the, to read again, though, the court shall notify the director of motor vehicles when a person has been ordered to install an ignition interlock device owned, leased, or regularly operated by the person. So those are the three things that were triggering mechanisms under the statute that went into effect in the year 2000, okay? So it would be a vehicle that you owned, a vehicle that you leased, and a vehicle that you regularly operated. That's logical, at least. And it indicates the following, the division shall require the device to be installed before reinstatement of the person's driver's license that has been suspended pursuant to 39450. So that's exactly what we said, that as a condition precedent to receive your license back, this statute makes it a requirement. You verify with motor vehicles that you had the ignition interlock device installed, but again, installed on these three types of vehicles, the vehicle that you own, lease, or regularly operate, okay? Yes. And then it, you also get a special notation on your driver's license under the statute, the division shall imprint a notation on the license stating that the person shall not operate a motor vehicle unless it's equipped with an interlock device and shall enter this requirement in the person's driving record. So the police stop you and they see this notation on your record and there is no ignition interlock device on the vehicle you're operating, that becomes an offense in and of itself. Yes, okay? understood. Now the problem is this, um, and under this version of the statute, judges were given the option of either requiring you to impose the ignition interlock device or suspending your registration privileges. And everybody went for the option of suspending registration privileges, figuring, listen, I can't drive anyway, so what's the difference? Yes. Or I don't own a car to begin with, it doesn't make any difference, it's essentially no harm, no foul. The legislature amended the statute in 2010. They never repealed this. Okay? Hmm. They changed the requirement for the ignition interlock device. It's 39450.17. This is the statute that went into effect um, in 2010. Except it's provided um, under paragraph 2 of this subsection. In sentencing a first offender on 39450, the court may, in addition to any other penalty imposed by that section, may order the installation of an ignition interlock device in the motor vehicle principally operated by the offender. 
following the expiration of the license suspension, okay? Yes. Principally operated. They have dropped the concept under the amendment of owned, operated, leased, leased. okay? So now you have a situation where the statute says two completely different things. In fact, it goes on to say the, the, the following thing. If you look at subsection 2, if the BAC is 0.15 or higher, the court shall order in addition to other penalties required by 450, the installation of an internal lock device in the motor vehicle principally operated by the offender during and following the expiration of the period of suspension. So if you look at 450.17, it just talks in terms of principally operated. What does that mean? They don't define it in the statute. So let me ask you, what does it mean? It would mean a car that they depend on to go to work, a car that they use most of their time uh, in doing their daily tasks. That, that really is ambiguous. And what do you do, let's say if we have a constitutional challenge, you have totally inconsistent uh, paragraphs, sections in the same law, which prevails or will that be void for vagueness or void for incomprehensibility? Some uh, enterprising attorney might want to consider I, a class I, action. Well, one of the arguments you might want to make is there was a, an implied repealer in the yes. sense that the uh, the 5017 is 10 years after the, the 5018, and maybe the legislature intended to repeal the, that earlier one. But However, they, they but, didn't do but it. But they didn't do it. And re implied repealers really are kind of disfavored in, in my recollection of statutory construction that the legislature really has to kind of, you know, indicate very clearly that they their intended intention to, their intention to, to supersede right yes so but this leaves us with what we call in the law a gigantic mess <laughs> so let me that's a very good term well, very let, me, let me ask you how you handle this with your own clients the guys played guilty okay there he mm -hmm. is and uh, let's let's keep it simple he's a 0.15 BAC he's played out he got a seven month suspension all right yes he does not own a car right what are you gonna tell him <laughs> You've got to install your interlock on the car you don't own. Okay. It's insane. Well, he's got to install it initially on the vehicle that, because if, if you look back at 18, all right. So, I mean, you can't sell your vehicle? Well, he or never owned a, let's say he never owned a car in the first place, but under 18, he has to install it. Motor vehicle's going to want to install it on the vehicle he owns, leases, or regularly operates, okay? He doesn't, he doesn't have any of those. any of those. Here it says on the vehicle that he principally operates. Okay, which I'm not sure whether that is different from regularly operate. Maybe the same thing. Wait for the appellate division to tell a us what the car difference. could be anything. Go tell your employer. Listen, I got to put an ignition interlock on in the car that you supply me with. How many times have I drive and it. how many times have I run into this with kids who are going to go to the police academy? Oh yeah, you know, and you just got to fight and fight and fight and fight and fight. In other words, the the police department will still take them with a drunk driving conviction, but they're not going to put an ignition interlock device on a, no. on, a on a police cruiser. Uh, what do you, but just get back to our guy though. Okay. Seven month suspension. Right. All right. Mm -hmm. You've just charged his client uh, $3,500 to plead him guilty. Worth every penny, by the way. <laughs> um, he does not own a car. How does he get his driver's license back? What would your advice be to that client? Pray. <laughs> <laughs> Pray no, seriously, uh, I think he would have a, a real problem just going through channels to try to get his license back unless he would then have to put the ignition interlock on the new car. But he doesn't have a car. No, he doesn't, he, well, car. No, he doesn't own it, but he's going to want to buy one. His suspension is over, right. at least in theory. Right. So when he buys the car, he's going to have to have an ignition interlock installed. But let's look at it from the perspective of just a regular client. I don't have a car. I can't afford car insurance. I don't want to buy a car. I just want to have a driver's license, okay? Mm -hmm. How does that person get his license back under the circumstances if there is no vehicle that he principally operates? What, is, what does he do? I say that he applies, and then if he if it's turned down, he asks for a hearing with Division of Motor Vehicles. Right. And I hate to say it, but the first one who does that will have to make a test case in the appellate division. Well, I'm, I'm going to take a different approach. Okay. Okay. I would tell somebody like this, and by the way, this would apply to two classes of people. It would apply to somebody who is in New Jersey, New Jersey resident, domiciliary doesn't own a car. Or alternatively to somebody who doesn't own a car who lives out of state, Pennsylvania or whatever it may right. be. Right. Comes to Jersey. I would say the following to him. This is probably bad legal advice, but I would say it anyway. You have a friend who has a car? Borrow your friend's car. 
go out and get an ignition interlock device installed on it tomorrow, Tuesday. Okay? Bring the proof to motor vehicles Wednesday and tell them this is the car I principally operate and here's the proof that the ignition interlock device is on there. Okay? They'll give you your driver's license back. At that point, since it's not your car, and you're not going to be driving that car anymore, principally or otherwise, I would just let it go. I wouldn't pay for, pay for an ignition interlock device at all. I'd just let it expire, return, turn it in, and that'd be the end of it. However, you've got to stress over and over and over again to your client, you cannot get into a vehicle anywhere in New Jersey, ever, that is not equipped with an ignition interlock device. I mean, that you've got to pound into their heads over and over again. You can't do it. You can't get into a car that doesn't have an ignition interlock device. If you do, that's a separate prosecution, separate offense. What do you think about that? This is stimulating another question. Sure. Will this be subjected to provisions of an interstate compact eventually? Reciprocity? Uh, will that be done? I, I'm just I'm a little worried about that because of the far reaching, uh, again, the tentacles. Yeah, I would imagine, let's take a guy here in New Jersey who, uh, you know, he's got his driving privileges restored, he's got the restriction for the interlock device, and let's say he flies to uh, Los Angeles or something, he wants to rent a car. Yeah. You know, is he going to have to rent a car that's equipped with an ignition interlock device? I mean, I can tell you right now, if you're a New Jersey guy and you're going to rent a car in New Jersey or lease a car, whatever it is, that vehicle's going to have to have an ignition yes. interlock device. But if he goes I'm elsewhere. Sure makes the, I'm sure that makes the uh, rental companies very happy. But won't <laughs> the, uh, won't the, the license have a notation? that he has to have one? Sure, sure. Now whether they pick up on it, I don't know. But the cops certainly will. They stop the guy, and they're, gonna, they're trained to look for this stuff. Yeah. Um, now the, I think that the rental car companies actually will, upon request, make a car with an ignition or lock device available to you. Um, let me ask you a question. I mean, in yes. your, and I don't know if you have any evidence about this, but do you have any thoughts about uh, whether or not this is actually effective? Does it save lives? Does it stop drunk drivers? Is there any... Epidemiological I haven't evidence seen any. of that? I haven't seen any. Uh, it would surprise me that anyone's wasted the time to do the research, unless Mothers Against Drunk Driving would. I don't know. I, I, uh, I don't know that that would cause the inquisitive mind to delve into it. Well, there, there certainly further. is a, uh, a strong relationship between Mothers Against Drunk Driving and the uh, ignition interlock device industry, so to speak. There's a lot of money exchanging hands in terms of um, donations and lobbying efforts that they do independently and jointly. Um, so they're really, uh, they're in a partnership, so to speak. Is there an Ignition Interlock Association? Oh, most, most definitely. Right. Most definitely. And so, and I'm sure they are in touch with Mothers Against Drunk Driving? Correct. Oh, they, they just, they work together because one of them has a vested financial interest in everybody having an ignition interlock device. And number two, um, you know, there's a lobbying effort. I guess the legislature's, you know, persuaded. I guess the Mothers Against Drunk Drivers are persuaded that this um, prevents drunk driving accidents. Um, but I don't, I don't know that there's any, um, any, any study that says that, yeah. you know. There may be. I'm just not aware of any. Um, I mean, in your own opinion, though, just from your own you know, work in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, do you have mm -hmm. a sense of whether or not this is working? I'll put it this way. I am sure it is a deterrent to someone who drives, who shouldn't drive, to draw from driving. Right. Okay. So maybe to that extent, do we know that on a specific day or time it would have happened? I, it may have some <laughs> slight intangible bearing. Right. But I don't think it's fair. I don't. I, think it, I don't think it's equitable. And I think it's overreaching. I don't believe in the first offenders having to have ignition interlocks once their license has been restored. Right. Well, I have to tell you that the um, the legislature is taking precisely 180 degree position from you because the, uh, the, the the bills that I have seen actually essentially decriminalize first offender DWI uh, conditioned upon them installing ignition interlock devices. In other words. They recognize the devastating impact of a license loss can have, especially on working families and yes. children. And uh, rather than having the uh, defendants be on the revoke list, they can substitute uh, ignition interlock devices. Of course, that brings up a couple of uh, additional uh, issues. But before we get into that, I, I wanted to ask you one other thing, just looking into the future. 
Um, do you foresee a day when ignition interlock devices will actually be part of the standard equipment of all vehicles? In other words, Congress will mandate that for vehicles produced after day X, every one of them have an ignition interlock device? I hope not. But, I mean, can you foresee that happening? Only to the extent that of a lot of crazier, sillier things have happened. I, I don't really, realistically foresee it, but I don't rule it out. I hate to be ambiguous. You just never know. Mm -hmm. The legislatures are not famous for thinking before they legislate. Is it, is it an available option on any vehicles now, as far as you know? In other words, can a parent, let's say, who's going to give his kid a car to take to college, um, have an ignition and lock device installed on it? Well, I would assume he could. As standard yeah, factory equipment? I don't think you have to have permission to do that. I'm not aware of any. any I mean, basically, I, that might be a good idea. Um, but, of course, it's going to affect everyone in the family. I think you, you have to watch kids. I wrote a, a blog about kids going away to school. What would you say? Uh, well, among other things, don't be so afraid of your parents that you don't tell them if you run into a problem, right. even if it's a speeding ticket. Right. The point is, it will ultimately catch up with you if you ignore it. Your license might be suspended, their insurance may go up, any, anything could happen. Couple, to, uh, there's yes. a couple of things you should include in the, in the blog, and one of them would be never, ever, ever get in the car with somebody who's been drinking. Yes. Never. Obviously, never get engaged in drunk driving, drinking and driving yourself. And uh, it's okay to be homesick. Yeah. It's okay to miss your dog, okay? <laughs> That's why God invented Skype and uh, email and things like that. Uh, I find that so often that you have children, they go away from home for the first time, and they're just so terribly homesick. Yes. Many times they just miss their dog. <laughs> <laughs> or their pillow or their stuffed animal. Yeah, but I mean, have you, have you experienced that with uh, young kids going away? Well, I... I have discussed it with many, and I've written articles on it, and uh, I've spoken to policemen about it. Right. The, sometimes the kids have been so afraid to tell their, their parents what's happening. Uh, one, one young lady was in Cape May County. They gave her the one call to her mother, and it was very plain to the police that they were, she was not talking to her mother, oh. and uh, she ended up in Cape May County prison until they bailed her out. Can I tell you a story about, about what happened to one of my clients? He, this was in Burlington County, um, and he's driving along intoxicated and wouldn't stop right away when the cops pulled him over. That's a good way to win friends and influence people. Well, the cops, you know, they saw that he was drunk, and I think that they forgave him. And they got him back to the police station, and they were going to release him on a summons. And the police officer made the comment to him, and said, you know, you're lucky we didn't charge with the looting because we'd lock you up on high bail. Yeah. And the guy started crying and begging them to charge him, begging him to charge him with looting, because that way he wouldn't have to go home and face his wife. All right? True story. So uh, they, they really punished him. They let him go. And boy, did he have hell to pay. Um, you know, you mentioned about the statute being unfair, illogical, and ridiculous. I'm being nice. But, well, yeah. but I just want to underscore the point you made by something else that's yes. in the law. Now, in New Jersey, you have a variety of ways you can get found guilty of drunk driving. You can be under the influence of alcohol, or you can have consumed such amounts of alcohol that within a reasonable period of time after operating a motor vehicle, you have a blood alcohol concentration of 0 0.08 or greater. Mm -hmm. You agree? Yes. Okay. That makes you guilty, and in those cases, the ignition interlock device is appropriate. Right. And we both agree that the ignition interlock device applies every time anybody's found guilty of drunk driving, with the sole exception that we talked about before with the BAC under point one five for first right. defense, non-school zone. Now it is also against the law in New Jersey and will result in you being found guilty of drunk driving to operate a motor vehicle under the influence of a narcotic mm -hmm. or something that produces a narcotic effect of a hallucinogen, mm -hmm. of a uh, habit producing drug or of a chemical inhalant, you know, huffing that the kids do. Question. Does the ignition interlock device have anything whatsoever to do with driving under the influence of hallucinogens or, narco or narcotics? Or, or the sleep aids. There's been a real problem with Ambion. I wrote a blog on that. Sure. Too. I mean, that really produces a terrible state. I, I think that's a very dangerous drug. But, well, but for the sleepwalking yeah. and sleep driving that yeah. it produces, oh, yeah. no doubt. So my question to you is, to what extent is there a rational relationship between someone who operates a motor vehicle under the influence of, say... I don't know, ambient, mm -hmm. for the sake of argument, and the ignition interlock device. Will the ignition interlock device pick up anything to no, do with ambient? I don't believe so. Uh, or 
if you're what's that the, the kids inhale uh, brake, oh. brake fluid or something yeah. like that uh, you know from the, when they do huffing uh, and I'm not talking about the Huffington Post although that <laughs> actually would be a good article for you yeah um, it has nothing to do with many of the ways people are found guilty of drunk driving right correct so why should it be that someone who is operating a motor vehicle intoxicated under with drugs or have producing drugs or hallucinogens or or you know, inhalants why should that individual have to have an ignition airlock device installed in his vehicle? The case has nothing to do with alcohol. I'm in total agreement. One thing I also would like to say, this is unrelated, I wish New Jersey would enact a work license, a bread and butter license. That's what my clients call to bread and butter license. Yeah, I mean, to be able to drive their car to work. Right. With an interlock device, if necessary, but I really believe that it is, it is unfair to not give the person a chance to really rehabilitate themselves mm -hmm. and uh, to add to their problems. And this doesn't mean that I believe anyone should be soft on drunk drivers. I just mean there has to be a little bit of what I call a common sense approach. What I call common sense may not be what someone else refers to it in that manner, but right. I, I, uh, I practice in both states, so I'm always getting that question. Well, it seems to me that I, if I had to predict the future, and you can never predict what the legislature is going to do except to add more confusion, um, but I suspect that if we ever do have a, a work license in New Jersey, a so-called bread and butter license, that um, it will be keyed toward getting a, um, a no pun intended, um, a, an ignition interlock device installed in the vehicle. However, there's major problems with that, okay? again. You go back to the individuals who are on the revoke list for being under the influence of narcotics or have producing drugs, things of yes. that nature. The ignition interlock device has nothing to do, it's not going to pick up on whether they're going to drive again in the future under those types of no. drugs. Number two, you have an equal protection issue as well because it's only the individuals who have the wherewithal to pay for the ignition interlock device that are going to be able to get the work licenses. Yeah. People who are marginally employed or just are part of the working poor or just don't have the money to do it, um, these are individuals who are just going to remain on the revoke list. True. Um, and it's going to take a fairly significant uh, legislative change because right now there's only one driver's license in New Jersey. Uh, it's a one plenary license. I mean they have gradients of it for people who are new drivers, you know, you have provisional licenses and things like that for children, um, you know, people who are under the age of 18. Um, but the, the point I'm trying to make is that it would require uh, a hybrid type of license that you could operate the vehicle under certain times of day, maybe perhaps only going to work and home. Yes. And again, in those cases where there was alcohol involvement, um, if they limited that way to having an ignition or locked device installed in the vehicle. But again, I don't know how you get around the equal protection issues. What do you think about that? I think it would be tough if that were if that were tested. Right. I don't think it's been brought up yet, but again, some enterprising civil rights attorney will, will be watching us and <laughs> might, uh, might thrust. Well, couldn't you make the argument, though, on behalf of a client? I mean, it seemed to be pretty mm -hmm. easy to do that. My client's an indigent. He can't afford this, and yet, you know, if he were financially in a better position, he could install he, it. He could install it. He would, he would get a license. So I don't right. know how you address the, uh, that issue. There's a whole lot more poor people out there than there are rich people, you know? Yes, unfortunately. What's going on in Montgomery, Town, uh, Montgomery County? How do they handle these things over there? When you're talking about ignition interlock, or you're talking about equal protection? We, both. Both. Yeah, I mean, we, how is this whole issue handled in Pennsylvania? Well, Pennsylvania is, is really a, uh, another, another world from New Jersey. I mean, very strict on drunk driving. Right. Um, usually, if you, uh, if you want a probationary license, you have to apply for it. You have to serve at least 60 days of Now, when of you say probationary, suspension. are you talking about a, like a bread and butter license, a work license? Yes, there is such a thing. Okay. And it, it's strictly regulated. It's not, you know, easily gotten. Does PennDOT do it, or is it done through the yeah, court? It's done through PennDOT. Okay. But uh, also, people may need it for medical reasons, so they can get to doctor's appointments. Uh, there, there are provisions. What uh, about uh, religious or consulting with counsel or things like that? Is that are those ex are there exceptions in there for that as well? I I think they it, you have to get special permission. You can put that in your application, and hope for the best. Right. 
And they, they are on the side of caution, too, at uh, PennDOT. What about ignition lock devices? What's going on in Pennsylvania with that? Well, there are such requirements. It is not quite the same as New Jersey and is not, I believe, as thorough as, as New Jersey. And it's, I think it's still growing in Pennsylvania. Can you talk a little bit about it? What does Pennsylvania require you to do with, in terms of upon conviction? Well, it doesn't happen with the first offense, that's for sure. Now, when you talk about the first offense... Actually, you have ARD Yeah, that's right. That's what I'm saying. The people get diverted into the ARD program. Yes. Can you talk for a couple seconds sure. about the ARD? That, that I really wish we had in New Jersey, too. Um, basically, what it is, if someone, if there's been no accident, the person is insured, the person had a valid license at the time, and did not have an excessively high reading, and that, of course, is, uh, that could be like 0.30 or 0.25. Um, to be an ARD, you have to apply. And if you are accepted, then you, you serve either six months a year of a form of probation. You may have to do community service. The costs are enormous, uh, depending on the county. Mm -hmm. And if you behave yourself and you don't get into any other trouble during the course of that probation, the charges will be withdrawn. And you can get them expunged. The only one that will keep a record of the fact that you were placed into ARD will be the district attorney because ARD is considered a first offense for sentencing purposes down the road. So if another DUI occurs within 10 years of your entry into ARD, it used to be seven, that's, that's an argument I, I uh, have about uh, that particular feature, too, but I'll get into that very quickly later. But if you, behave, if, uh, if you get into another DUI situation, um, that is considered a second offense, and then you have a jail sentence, a bigger loss of license, and uh, it, it definitely can have a, a drastic effect. In, in your experience, uh, what percentage of the people who have a ARD and then get caught within the next 10 years with another DUI do you actually wind up doing 60 or 90 days in jail? What happens, uh, well, a lot of them do, but of course there's house arrest, there's intermediate punishment, intermediate placement. Sometimes they'll do a reduced amount of time and then be on house arrest for the remainder. Uh, they have to be in that county. They have to have uh, within range of that county so they can have telephone monitoring. Correct. I mean, it is humane. Some counties are stricter than others. Mm -hmm. There are some counties uh, where after 10 years you can get ARD again. Right. And there are some that, uh, that are very reluctant to allow that to happen. I'm just curious, which is better, the Montgomery County Jail or the Delaware County Jail? <laughs> um, I don't know, and I really don't want to find out personally. <laughs> now, basically, um, you know, I get mixed reviews. I don't think that there's a song by Johnny Cash uh, or Waylon Jennings, There Ain't No Good Chain Gang. But I want to bring this up to everybody about the relationship between uh, ARD and uh, New Jersey. Okay, yes. This is very important for everybody to understand. The first thing I'm going to say, there's no case law to back me up, it's just my opinion, and that is that an ARD disposition in Pennsylvania is not uh, the same as a conviction for sentencing purposes in New Jersey. So the argument I've always made is that if someone had an ARD disposition in, in Pennsylvania and then gets arrested in New Jersey after the fact, um, that person could rightfully be considered as a first offender. Now there's no case law to, to that effect. I do this by parsing the statute and they use yes. the word violation and things like that. So. Um, Reasonable people can differ on this, and the appellate division may say that I'm wrong at some point, but by, for advocacy purposes, I think that's the position you have to take. Number two, the official state policy as promulgated by the legislature is that people in New Jersey should be entitled to a diversion from the criminal justice system only once in their lifetimes. There are three programs in New Jersey that permit you to have um, a diversion from the criminal justice system. They are um, pretrial intervention for the right. Superior Court, uh, the Conditional Discharge mm -hmm. Program in Municipal Court for Drug Offenses, and then for Disorderly Persons Offenses and Petty Disorderly Persons Offenses in Municipal Court, the so-called Conditional Dismissal Program. Yeah. Okay? The key I want everybody to understand is, and this is based upon an opinion from the Appellate Division, um, if you go through ARD in Pennsylvania, 
that does not, and I repeat, not constitute a diversion from the criminal justice system such that you'd be disqualified from a diversion in New Jersey. It is only New Jersey programs that yes. disqualify you from a subsequent uh, diversion from the criminal justice system. So if by way, for example, if you've gotten ARD and then you get into criminal trouble in New Jersey, you're eligible to get into PTI because the ARD does not count against you in New Jersey. However, if you had gotten a conditional discharge earlier in your lifetime, then you screw up again years later and you want to get into PTI, you're, yeah, you're, they don't want to see that. You're out of luck. You can't get it. Or, if you'll forgive me, if you have a DUI conviction in New Jersey, right, um, and you were you're attempting to get ARD in Pennsylvania, you may be disqualified from getting it, right. and you'll have a reciprocal loss of license. Now, if you get a Jer if you're if you get a New Jersey conviction, the loss of license, if you uh, Get into, uh, or you will not be you will not be suspended in Pennsylvania automatically for your first offense in New Jersey. Right under the compact. I mean, it's interesting to see the diversification of, of remedies. And yeah, I, I want to talk about that for two quick seconds, just in terms of how Pennsylvania is handling these things mm -hmm. uh, beyond any uh, ignition interlock device issues. So let's say somebody comes over here's licensed in Pennsylvania, gets convicted in New Jersey, it's a first offense. Uh, is PennDOT actually going to do anything to the guy? If if they get convicted in Jersey, first offense? Correct. Okay. Pennsylvania will probably not, they will send them a letter. Right. Like, we know what you did. <laughs> right. But they will probably not suspend their license in Pennsylvania as a result, under the interstate compact. Now, is the reason for that, from, Pen from PennDOT's perspective, is that if the offense occurred in, in Pennsylvania, he would have gotten ARD anyway? I mean, do they take that position? That's, that may, I'm not sure what their thinking is, but that is quite possible. And you ever know anybody who didn't get into ARD? Because of a, a jersey? No, just because uh, they're just a bad person or something. Oh, like that. oh. Um, yeah, I know some people who were rejected, usually because there was an accident uh, well, with an injury, or maybe they, if they weren't insured, or if they if they were unlicensed or the license was suspended, right. uh, they would not be permitted to be in, to, in ARD. Um, I want to go back for a second, sure. um, just to, to kind of go back to, to focus on the Pennsylvania treatment of uh, um, people either getting an ARD or being yeah. convicted with respect right. to the ignition interlock device. How does that tie into Pennsylvania sentencing? Basically, it's more, well, it's a PennDOT issue, but um, it's administrative. Yeah, it's really administrative. I have not recently, at least, had a court order the ignition interlock in Pennsylvania where they're getting, um, where let's say they're getting a conditional license and it's a second, it's a second offense and they're trying to get a uh, bread and butter license in Pennsylvania. Right. And they had the ARD first. Um, there may be a requirement of the ignition interlock. I haven't run into it only because as many cases I handle, and I'm just being candid with you, I haven't run into that perfect situation for it. Well, and I'm doing more research on that. What do you think the difference is? the difference between Pennsylvania and New Jersey on this, Just is it purely political? It may be. I, I don't know if they haven't lobbied as much over there or whether the legislature just as uh, and PennDOT together have taken a different position on it. That would that would merit further research, which I will certainly be glad to undertake. Now, as busy as we both are, there are offenses that you would think we would get more of, and I haven't seen any of these, but I want to go through them. It's, sure. These are codified under uh, 35 colon 4 50 point 19, which went, these are all the yes. things that you can do wrong by not getting an ignition interlock device. So let me just go through all the additional statutes you can violate it says, a person who fails to install an ignition interlock device ordered by the court in a motor vehicle owned, leased, or regularly operated by him shall have his license suspended for one year additional. Okay? Yes, right. Um, here's another one that you can do. A person whose vehicle and interlock device is installed pursuant to court order who drives that vehicle after it's been started by any means other than his own blowing into the device. Um, Jumps the ignition. <laughs> That's right. No, yeah. you have a, you have your friend come in the car yeah. and say, uh, "Do me a favor. I got to start the car. Blow into the ignition interlock device." Or while you're driving, have the sample taken from the other person's breath as opposed to your breath. Okay. 
It's also a disorderly person's offense to do the following things. Uh, blow into an interlock device or otherwise start a motor vehicle equipped with such a device for the purpose of providing an operable motor vehicle to a person that's been ordered to install the device. So if the person does the blowing, I guess, is guilty of a DP. Tamper or in any way uh, circumvent the operation of the interlock device or knowingly rent, lease, or lend a motor vehicle not equipped with an ignition interlock device to a person who has been ordered by the court to install an interlock device the vehicle he owns, leases, or regularly operates. Okay. Yes. Um, and they have one of, one of the provisions here. It says uh, this does not apply um, if the motor vehicle required to be equipped with an ignition lock device is started by a person for the purpose of safety or mechanical repair of the device. So I guess the technicians yeah. who do this can yeah. do that. Um, they're, they're exempt under the statute. So, I mean, these are additional things the legislature has kind of anticipated that nonsense people will be up to. and. <laughs> uh, by punishing them in this way, they could get, I guess, up to six months in jail and up to a thousand dollar fine. Um, it's a big mess. Okay, yes. Pennsylvania it isn't worth like, it. Yeah, well, Pennsylvania sounds like a lot more civilized to me. Well, it is for now. And uh, plus, you can hunt <laughs> over there with a rifle, which is uh, something you can't do in New Jersey. Um, so, any final uh, words of advice to our listeners about the significant intellect device business? I mean, sounds to me like because of the unfairness. Um, I'd like to see them write to their legislators and seek a repeal. Right. And of course, uh, that's reluctant for them to do anything that's going to sound politically incorrect or politically uh, uncaring. But truthfully, the hardship, I think perhaps maybe they should talk to some of their union representatives, get some labor support. I have my own feelings about it. Could you share your feelings with us? Yeah, just basically, I think the entire process of in ignition interlock, especially with a first offense, is just inequitable, fair, and confiscatory. And again, as you talked about equal protection of laws, people with financial hardship right. are going to be unable to have it done. Uh, it's, it's, it's definitely, I feel, something that needs to be remedied. Would you say that there may be some utility, I mean, assuming that this, there's some palpable objective evidence to suggest that the ignition interlock device actually helps to require to be imposed um, in areas where there is no drunk driving, but yet alcohol played a factor, for example, domestic violence or assault yes. of conduct or some type of thing like that, that judges have the option or requirement of imposing this interlock device in other types of Offenses where the person has a predilection to be intoxicated, he just hasn't been caught driving yet. What if they're think? on probation or parole and they're not allowed to drink, right. that might be one. But as far as domestic violence, I think that's really reaching too far. Okay. Well, I don't want to sound like a radical here, but uh, it's a very, very difficult proposition. And it's yes. been all the more difficult proposition because the lobbyists who are behind this are coming in from two different perspectives. I don't have any doubt about the bona fides and sincerity of the lobbyists for for the Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. Right. Um, by the same token, the lobbyists who are pushing this from the perspective of the ignition interlock device people uh, have a pure financial motive. So uh, when you put these things together and throw in a good measure of politics, um, it um, it's a prescription for um, for mischief. Let's put it that I way. I agree. So um, I'm going to go over to Pennsylvania. Can you find me a place to live in Delaware County? <laughs> <laughs> Chester sounds fine. <laughs> yeah, Chester County is nice. Well, I, want to be near, I want to be near the gambling. Oh, okay. But uh, radicals do have their place in society, by the way. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> Sal, thank you so much for participating today. wonderful. And uh, to our uh, listeners on uh, It's Your Law, <laughs> thanks for joining us today.